Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin with a lecture for uh, Legal 202, Spring 2016, um, Computer Technology in the Law Office. Uh, this lecture is on Chapter 7 of the Cornick book, um, and this uh, chapter covers electronic discovery. So the reason electronic discovery is set apart in this book um, is because of the changes that have occurred uh, due to increased use of technology uh, in business and in our daily lives and then the the follow-on effect of that which is during the discovery process of civil litigation business litigation Litig even criminal litigation, um, parties have a right to ask for and obtain emails, um, things that are stored electronically. And as we, uh, you know, the use of technology in includes, particularly for large businesses or, or um, even medium, small, medium sized businesses. Um, but even individually, we store things electronically. We have it on a USB. We save our emails um, in the um, email server. Um, and for businesses, additionally, um, they store things on tape. So um, the changes in the um, rules of civil procedure and the federal civil procedure rules um, occurred after many lawsuits, one in particular, the Zubalaki case, um, but many lawsuits where Discovery asked for emails and the response from um, the company that was to produce the emails was that well, we no longer have it. It's it's saved on tape, um, and those tapes regularly get reused, or it's been deleted, and we can't um, produce it. So uh, I'm trying to see if in chapter seven they go into much depth of the Zubalaki case. And I do not see it. So I am going to uh, uh, pull up a browser really quick. Um, sorry. Wait, let me exp expand this a little bit. So um, Zubalaki B uh, versus USB Warburg uh, was the seminal case for um, uh, the crying need uh, of electronic discovery um, rules in order to guide parties in litigation to know what must and what 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 must be done, what must be produced. How do we? guide parties in litigation uh, and guide lawyers to advise parties to produce documents um, that are stored electronically. So I'll just, this is case briefs. I like this um, and I'll enlarge this. Uh, hold on one second. Oh, I wonder if I can enlarge it. I may not be able to. Uh, let me scroll this up. So this is a link to the case. This is a brief of the case. And essentially, um, Laura Zubalaki uh, was suing. Um, sorry, I hope you're not getting vertigo since I keep moving it. So Laura Zubalaki was suing for gender discrimination. And they were looking for a number of emails. And UBS Warburg is a large investment bank and uh, did not produce the emails claiming that it was stored electronically. And um, Laura Zubalaki's lawyers then got into it with the UBS Warburg lawyers and a lot of judges got involved because the issue as it's stated right down here is, um, how do I get this over there? 
did I do it? Hopefully you can see it. The issue is whether the, the defendant is required to produce, electo uh, produce uh, electronic data to comply with discovery. And can they, and then how should that data be produced? What should it look like? Because do you just turn over the tapes? Do you hire someone to turn over, to, to go through the tapes? And if I, and, and typically in discovery, when someone asks me for something, I am not um, required to hire someone. I instead, um, you know, uh, am only required to produce documents that um, I have in my possession um, that I can easily um, turn over to the other side. It shouldn't be cumbersome, burdensome, should not be a huge expense. But for electronic data, it is a huge expense. Um, and uh, an entire cottage industry has grown up around uh, helping uh, parties to litigation to store data, go through data, deliver data. Um, and IT experts need to do that. Certainly, we don't want lawyers doing that. And it goes both ways. So if UBS Warburg were to turn over its tapes, then does Laura Zubalaki then need to incur a very large expense to um, go through them? And how should they be turned over? Uh, and so on and so on. So uh, that's just um, uh, the history of why we have these special rules and why this this chapter is in here. Um, hopefully all of you have taken civil litigation, um, but if you haven't, just briefly, um, you know, uh, discovery in general is that um, concept in a, a Anglo-American law that, or certainly U.S. law and litigation, that we um, begin the the litigation process after the pleadings with a discovery period where I ask you questions and you answer them within the civil procedure rules. I get to take depositions. I get to know, um, I get to see documents. Um, I get to request information and request that you produce information, documents, records, pictures, emails, um, and, and like that. So this chapter uh, is an overview of electronic discovery and looks specifically at the federal rules and what they say. And, and this is a, uh, I mean, the process is uh, not brand new, but it continues to evolve because as technology and word processing and Adobe becomes uh, more sophisticated, um, documents are stored in all kinds of different ways and how we review them for litigation is also governed by ethical codes and um, uh, issues come up with, uh, if you have a thousand pages of Adobe documents, could you write a program that reviews them in order to pull out the information that would be helpful for you at trial? And if I, if I as a, a law firm or a lawyer write that program and Am I still fulfilling my obligation to the client? What if the program misses something? Uh, is that grounds for malpractice? And um, so things like that, predictive coding, um, going through, and don't even think 1,000, think 150,000 pages of Adobe. And, and how much would it cost me? to hire a paralegal or a junior associate to go through that. Wouldn't it be easier if I did write a program and had the program process all that data and find the relevant information for my client? Um, or can I ask the other side to do that? Like, don't turn over 150,000 pages of a, um, documents in PDF. You get a program <laughs> to and, and call that down. You know, that's burdensome and cumbersome for me. It's um, voluminous. Um, I shouldn't be required to have to go through that many documents, that kind of thing. Okay, so hopefully that set a little bit of the stage for Chapter 7, which is electronic discovery, 
the process in the rules um, of producing and receiving litigation documents. Both sides are governed by the rules. And, um, and we all uh, hopefully by now uh, have a, a general understanding that discovery is one of the stages of litigation that takes place before trial um, where parties are exchanging, are, are required to exchange information. So traditionally discovery uh, is in um, lots of different forms, but here are four um, forms of discovery. Uh, the oral testimony taken from parties under oath, um, which is a deposition, a written request for information and interrogatories um, and the responses to those requests. You could have a, a admission, a set of admissions where you provide or exchange a statement of facts um, where each party must admit or deny those facts um, and admissions, um, so interesting, but uh, I know this isn't a civil litigation lecture. Um, and then fourth on this slide, producing hard copy documents in, re in response to either a uh, request for production of documents or a subpoena, um, do just take them, which is just, you need to bring this with you to trial. Um, maybe you're a non-party, maybe you're a party, we want you at the trial and we would like you to bring these documents. So here, maybe, um, I don't know, for example, let's say a, a medical practice is being sued for sexual harassment. Um, work files must be brought by the HR person at the medical place um, that kept track of um, complaints um, and that kind of thing. Document production is super important for discovery. Um, it's required, but it uh, it's it's um, it's established it establishes facts documents can um, uh, reveal what parties were thinking at the time emails certainly can show where people were where people's thinking was at at a particular time uh, in the Zubalaki case Laura Zubalaki worked on a trading desk at USB Warburg and her claim was for she wasn't being promoted because of her gender and uh, people were talking about her gender um, and some of the emails that eventually did get produced and were discovered did talk about her being fat or old um, and how they would never promote her and that kind of thing. Um, and since then now also uh, pe people at, at least on Wall Street are, well they used to be, I, I don't know if they still are, but are a lot more careful of what they say in emails as we all should be. Um, so what this slide describes, so to, many documents are kept in electronic format, but the second dash right here, or bullet point, um, what it uh, gets at is that best evidence rule in the, uh, uh, in the rules of evidence which say um, if uh, I want to produce the best evidence, the most accurate native form of something. So if I have a gun that was involved in a crime, I don't bring a picture of the gun, I bring the gun. If I have a contract and it's a breach of contract, I don't take a picture with my phone and show that picture, I bring the contract in. So the courts and the evidence rules require that the best evidence be produced and that best evidence for electronic documents is the electronic version of the document and not a printed hard copy of that document. So that's what this slide is getting at, that concept that if it's native, if the native form of this document is electronic, then that is how it should be produced, not printed. Um, so electronic documents uh, can come in many, many, many different formats. They are difficult to destroy. 
um, it, the, the slide says few people understand what an electronic document really is and certainly few lawyers understand. Paralegals probably understand um, more accurately since they're creating many of these documents, but information saved on the document, the metadata, who wrote it, who's the author of the document, um, you know, uh, some cases have um, uh, been about whether parties can erase metadata. So if your client kept notes in a Word document and uh, you know, when that document is discoverable, can opposing counsel or the other party to the litigation require that none of that metadata be scrubbed, that I need to know exactly the dates and times revisions were made, and that I need to know who all the authors were on that document and that metadata. When I ask you for the document, I'm entitled to all the metadata as well, and not just the electronic scrubbed version of that document. So as you can see, um, the electronic discovery concepts uh, around these rules um, uh, are um, uh, go from uh, what do I want to say the 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 challenges of electronic discovery uh, increase uh, as um, we begin to produce documents electronically and and some law firms the whole law firm policy is to scrub metadata off of every document that leaves its office um, but what if I want that and what if that is what I meant by my uh, request for production my request for documents I don't want metadata scrub that kind of thing okay so let's take a look at the rule the federal rules of civil procedure um, for ESI or electronically stored information it's federal rule 34 and it describes what ESI includes it is a term of art and hopefully you've encountered that word before term of art in law means um, this is how we refer to this thing and this thing is electronically stored information and we're going to call it ESI so uh, terms of art are uh, phrases or shortcuts that try to accurately describe a group of many things. So you can see ESI includes graphs and photographs, audio, recordings, images, and in general, other data compilations stored on any media. Um, So how does the rule work? Rule 26F says if ESI is going to be requested in discovery, then as soon as that is known, and sometimes that's immediately, sometimes that's not immediately, sometimes you don't know that things are electronically stored until you begin to request them, that a meet and confer session is mandatory so this will allow lawyers to work together collaborative, collaboratively with clients helping clients understand um, what's required under the rules but then also helping everybody understand what are we talking about how much um, ele electronically stored information um, are we looking at what do I what am I going to be requesting giving both sides so this mandatory meet and confer is to get the lay of the land to assess how big the problem is is this manageable uh, do we need, need to get the judge involved and can we agree to things um, ourselves so the challenges of ESI are many there's a lot of it it can come from all of these places listed on this slide um, many, many um, businesses, small to large, give uh, employees uh, their own phones, work phones, lap laptops that are owned by the business. All of that is discoverable. Um, all of that during litigation uh, should be produced. Uh, web history, voicemail.
And as I mentioned earlier, another one of the challenges um, is the metadata challenge that uh, how documents were modified, accessed, copied could be very relevant to a case. Um, and if a party does permanently change metadata, scrub metadata, it can lead to sanctions if they were required to produce that document with the metadata stored. And many of us know, and I know many of um, you all uh, know a lot about electronically stored uh, information just from having to produce um, homework and word process and having used computers for a long time, that ESI isn't really deleted. It's kept somewhere. And that is why part of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure includes this concept of a litigation hold. Meaning, as soon as you know you're getting sued, the rules will require the lawyers to inform you and you uh, must stop erasing or destroying tapes or electronically stored information. So the litigation hold refers to this idea that, um, for example, in the Zubalaki uh, UBS Warburg case, Warburg was reusing the data tapes that um, they were storing ESI on. Um, and so a litigation hold in that case would have meant the minute Zubalaki sued, they could no longer write over uh, or erase any of those tapes. And so uh, until uh, litigation uh, was completed. The federal rules also create um, this duty to exchange a uh, litigation whole uh, exchange and continue to preserve ESI. This is a more fulsome description of what the litigation hold requires. As soon as a potential party anticipates litigation, it becomes obligated under the rules to preserve that electronic data and to stop um, destruction uh, or another term of art, what we say is um, spoilation, which just means the, the things were being erased or, or no longer accessible, data was no longer accessible. So, um, in general, in discovery, particularly of like business records or things kept in the normal course of business, the the format, uh, how once you request a document, how that document is produced, the format isn't specified. It can be reduced in whatever format it it lives in as it's ordinarily maintained. So uh, if it's an email, that format does not need to change. I can just produce the electronically stored email. If it's a medical record, I don't have to conform or change the format of how that record is produced. Instead, however it is or ordinarily maintained, that is how I'm going to be required to produce it under the rules. In general, there is generally no duty to produce things, documents, or otherwise that create an undue burden or undue cost on the party, um, party being requested to produce it. So here, the federal rules are uh, consistent with what is traditionally the, the um, discovery rules, which is I can I can not produce things here, electronically stored information, and tell you the reason I'm not producing it is because the data is inaccessible and it would cost me a lot of money and it would be an undue burden. The discovery rules don't allow me to, don't force me to go bankrupt in order to, to produce documents or if the data is truly inaccessible, do not need to um, burden myself uh, or spend uh, undue amounts of money in order to get that data for you. So here uh, the parties requesting the data 
have to um, uh, uh, be reasonable when requesting the data. The producing party must show that the data is inaccessible. Um, and the producing party may still, at the end of the day, have to produce it if the information is super relevant and unavailable from any other source. And that is true of um, other discoverable uh, data and information. Just meaning that many of these rules mirror just general practice for uh, discovery and civil litigation. So now what happens um, if you inadvertently produce something that's electronically stored that was confidential, it was work product, you weren't required to produce it, and there was a privilege covering it, but you inadvertently produced it. What, uh, um, what are uh, parties required to do if they have inadvertently produced some information. So there's a clawback provision in the federal rules saying that um, th it, there is a process if the, if the party inadvertently produce uh, when in fact it was privileged. Um, I want to briefly, let me go one, one more slide. I want to briefly show you. So, so there's also um, an ethical problem here, like what happens if opposing counsel inadvertently produced documents to you, you saw them, and you realize they were privileged, covered by work, pro pro work um, product privilege or another privilege, what do you do? So the clawback provision says you can, you can request it back, but what are you ethically required to do? Um, is there a burden on you as the receiver of that to send it back. And um, I'm sorry to do this to you. I know this isn't, uh, I didn't plan this ahead of time, but it's coming up in the middle of this lecture and I don't want to um, let it go. What we want to look at, uh, let me get the Google, um, what we want to look at is what are the California rules? Is there an ethical obligation? Um, California ethical um, rule legal discovery inadvertent disclosure. Let's see what comes up with that. Here's the Cal Bar website and the article says you, what happens to the attorney-client privilege you inadvertently disclosed um, in violation of the attorney-client privilege, which is the California rule says, and it's governed by the, oh, the by the California Business and Professions Code. Um, so disclosure of confiden confidential information um, then it cites the evidence code, what is confidential communication and information. The client is the holder of the privilege. Uh, okay, but what happens for an inadvertent disclosure? And California does not have an inadvertent disclosure rule. The rules are silent. Um, the ABA model rules, which are not binding on California, however, um, says that if there's an inadvertent disclosure, wait, hold on, let me get to it. Sort of, okay. If there's an inadvertent disclosure, um, uh, the sender can take productive method, uh, methods, which would be to claw back, to try and get the email back. Um, 
to see where it says because there's a couple of states that actually do impose a duty to uh, a, a affirmative duty to send the um, email back mm. so you may be required because the California does have it not not necessarily send the email back but to let to the client know if if you consider it a significant development um, to let the client know that a document was inadvertently disclosed um, and here at the bottom where it talks about uh, accidentally hitting reply all uh, as opposed to just hitting reply um, I'll provide uh, Professor Newman with these links um, to put in your blackboard. Uh, it, it depends. <laughs> I hate to sound like a lawyer, but it really is going to depend. Um, and, and the fact that there's case law means that uh, it wasn't clear what the ethical code said. And, and um, I haven't read these cases. And did they sue for... Hmm. Yeah, uh, it it will will depend, and it, and whether of course the lawyer even lets the party know that things were inadvertently um, disclosed. Okay, moving on to another subject. Sorry, that was a little uh, rough. I I thought about that while I was lecturing and didn't want to miss the opportunity to take a look at it. So safe harbor. What if you accidentally or inadvertently destroy electronic stored information or ESI um, there is a safe harbor if through good faith operation it got destroyed and you weren't trying to hide it then you hide information then you would not be sanctioned so uh, like other discovery rules you are uh, preserving an assembly the information it has to be produced um, nice little electronic discovery reference model uh, you know is it relevant I'm gonna preserve it and produce it is, is how much is there of it is it voluminous um, that's super important so the the down and dirty of it is you're being sued you're a business you retained counsel and received because of the litigation hold requirements you received a preservation letter from your lawyer this letter is sent very early in the process um, everybody is going to be told please preserve ESI don't destroy it then the lawyers uh, are going to negotiate and meet and confer and negotiate how, how are we going to exchange this data what is it going to look at look at like are we going to hire outside IT to help us um, you know are we going to uh, agree on a format are we going to agree on metadata are there any privileges involved uh, is some of the data inaccessible so essentially just meeting and conferring and talking about all the things that were previously discussed on these slides um, there needs to be a catalog of all client ESI um, to uh, keep track of it and also safeguard against spoilation accusations which just means somebody's being accused of deleting it um, and that's not cool and uh, against the rules um, so clients so very large clients may have their own IT uh, staff to help collect ESI um, the law firm could hire a third-party vendor that's what I meant by the cottage industry that grew up around helping parties in business litigation a professional third-party vendor who in many instances will also be bound by rules of confidentiality and attorney-client privilege um, when they see information they're they're essentially part of the lit litigation team um, you know not to duty not to disclose and that kind of thing um, how are these documents going to be produced in its native format are you going to put it into a file structure the PDF or TIFF um, some information will be kept uh, in a format that's 
obsolete, if it's very, very old, and certainly that, that happens as well, where uh, lawsuits happen uh, much later um, and uh, documents are stored in a media um, uh, file, a media um, format that's very old called legacy data. We talked about metadata. And yeah, sure, it can be used to prove a theory of a case if a, somebody is saying they they didn't see a document, they never saw a document, they never knew anything about it, and you have metadata in the in a in a Word doc that shows that they uh, read or revised a document that contained information. Very very uh, um, very possible scenario. So uh, system metadata, the computer operating system, application metadata, the uh, attachment name when it was sent, um, who created it, when it was revised. You can go into a Word doc and look at the data there, when, who authored the article, uh, the article, the document, that kind of thing. So predictive coding um, was what I was mentioning in the kind of the intro to this lecture that um, for review, uh, so if you get a thousand pages of PDF, you could have a paralegal review it, or you could write a computer program or algorithm that can predict whether the remaining documents are going to be relevant to the re discovery request, request have be protected by privilege or be otherwise confidential. And the question is, is that a flawed system? Does that system comply with, comport with, you know, zealously representing our client, protecting all the client privileges? Um, when you, I mean, this is a duty and an ethical duty of the lawyer representing the client to um, review the documents to, and if you're outsourcing that, um, that can be very problematic or potentially problematic. Um, as with most things, uh, when ESI is involved, there's cost uh, variables that must be considered. Am I, how, how much data needs to be produced? Can I afford a third party vendor to do it? Um, how complex will it be producing this data? Can I manage it? Um, Third-party vendors can process the data. They will view the data. Um, they'll harvest the data, and as I mentioned, be on the litigation team. Computer forensics is used to recover and analyze electronic data. Um, they can recover destroyed data, or or show that data was intentionally destroyed, um, deleted uh, on purpose. Um, With most um, documents, with many documents, business records in particular, but with many documents, the rules of evidence require that a chain of custody be established to show that this electronically stored information was not altered and came from the source and was kept somebody needs to authenticate that this this document electronically stored went from the tape or data storage at the business or data storage at my medical office or data storage at my home computer and came to the court without being altered. So chain of custody, uh, the best way to describe it is when you get the um, evidence clerk in the criminal trial who says, yes, I, I entered this gun into evidence. It was stored in the police evidence locker. It was never checked out. Nobody ever came to see it. And then when it was requested to be produced at trial, I followed the normal procedures I always follow to uh, bring that gun to trial here today. Establishing that the gun was not altered, exchanged, um, and you, the person testifying, is authenticating that the chain of custody 
was maintained. So it's systematically tracing the ESI back to anyone who had access to it. Um, sort of like with, no, sort of like, w with many, a anytime you're using a third party vendor, it becomes a problem for discovery issues. Um, you're not typically outsourcing your paralegals. Sometimes uh, you are, but for litigation, you're using your in-house paralegals who know the, the case. And, and as you outsource to third party vendors for any activity, um, you have to closely watch their work, make sure no ethical violations are taking place. Um, for all these ethical reasons, which I've been mentioning throughout, you know, you have to act in the best interest of your client. So is a third party vendor going to be bound by that same ethical obligation? Are they going to work to the their best of their ability? Um, you're their client, but you as a lawyer, as a law firm, you also have a client. Um, legal professor, professionals do have an affirmative uh, obligation to tell clients what the problems are going to be with ESI uh, when they're involved in um, litigation. And um, clients need to be told that there is a litigation hold, that a preservation letter will be sent, that they have to retain uh, not destroy um, information. They have to come up with a policy internally themselves um, for when they get sued, uh, how you're going to maintain um, the data and not allow it to be destroyed. And the clients need to learn about their own computer systems. Um, and that's part of the changes to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure is to assist lawyers in, ass in representing clients and assist them also in helping clients during um, a discovery of ESI. Okay, uh, and that's Chapter 7. Thank you.